Okay. 3.1.5.2 DNA replication. DNA usually is a double helix. I'm going to do this. That's a pretty bad representation of what the double helix looks like, but for diagrammatic purposes, it's okay. Okay, so the first step, the DNA can't copy when it's like this. It needs to be unwound. Okay, and this is done by an enzyme. This enzyme is called DNA helicase. Anything ending in ASE is always an enzyme. DNA helicase, amylose, ribulose, biphosphate, carboxylase, neuraminidase. Any ASE is an is a enzyme and therefore it's also a protein. That's an often a backhanded question that they get asked in the specification very often. Okay, so DNA helicase, what does that do? Well, in fact, let me finish drawing. I'll draw four bases on here. And we'll do them, we'll, let's go C, A, see if you can remember what they are, T and G. So this was our corresponding opposite pair, C always bonds with G, A always with T, T always with A, and G always with C. Okay, so these were partners on each opposite sides. And remember, these are anti-parallel. I'm going to actually draw a little pentagon there. My upside down pentagons, I must work on that. So these again, remember, are anti-parallel. This chain is going this way, this chain is going this way. We have these sometimes you might have heard in school called three prime and five prime. I've checked the specification. There's no mention of three prime and five prime. We do need to know the significance of it being anti-parallel, but that's it for now. So what notes can we make here? Well, DNA helicase. And again, you need to know this. It's not something I'm including for no good reason. Key term, DNA helicase. What does it do? It unwinds the DNA by breaking the hydrogen bonds. That's a, that's a key point between the complementary bases. So complementary A with T, so A and T or C and G. So that's what DNA helicase does. Now it's open. So what's the next step? Well, I need a bit more space for this diagram. And draw a bit wider. We're still anti-parallel. Okay, DNA helicase is moving up the DNA strand. Okay, well, Let's copy what the whole of the other diagram first. Again, we've got C, A, T, and G on this side. G, T, A, and C on this side. Something that I'm about to draw actually as a little side point. Previously, see if you can remember what a nucleotide looked like. Remember we've got a phosphate, we've got a pento sugar. This is DNA, so the DNA sugar is deoxyribose, and we have our nitrogen space. This is a nucleotide. Now I'm gonna, for this purposes, yeah, I'm gonna make this one A. So I'm, in this diagram, I'm gonna represent one nucleotide as this. Now you're gonna see why. This chain is obviously all polynucleotides. Polynucleotide, polynucleotide, sorry, nucleotide, 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 joined together to form a polynucleotide. So in this diagrammatical form, we've just got straight lines. So if we were to zoom in on any of these sections, we would see these, and obviously it would be continued. So when I'm drawing these things floating around, which I'm about to do up here, um, it doesn't really matter what these are. I haven't I drawn A? I haven't drawn Going crazy, T. Okay, so I've drawn, if you've, if I've drawn these on opposite sides purely for the diagram that I'm about to draw. If we turn one upside down, imagine our pentagon being there. Uh, we then turn our pentagon upside down, and then we end up with a bit more of an understanding of this anti-parallel. So I've drawn the letters on the left here purely because they're going to go into this side, uh, and the letters on the right here because they're going to go into this side. But these molecules, their pentagons, their pento sugars, will be facing the opposite direction. Okay, so... I'm going to draw, these guys have already bonded on. So G, our complementary base pair there. Got T, our complementary base pair there. Got 
A here, and this one I'm going to draw, leave a gap, and this one's going to be C. Now, to join, to, to con make this condensation reaction, we need another enzyme, and this enzyme is running in this direction. This enzyme is called DNA polymerase, and we're going to use them him a lot. Yeah, polymer A's. A's means enzyme, polymer means polymer or many units, and DNA. So it's the enzyme that makes the polymer of DNA. Now, because these are going in opposite directions, this one's a little bit different. Here, DNA polymerase is an enzyme, it has an active site, it's complementary to only one specific substrate and that substrate is going to be our nucleotide but our nucleotide is is going to be facing different ways so this time on this side our joinings are going to take place in the opposite direction because uh, the train is anti-parallel now okay i'm going to put a few little annotations on this now so we need to know what these things are called so this is dna polymerase yeah it's not the best idea to label in the same color. But I think if you're watching carefully, that should be fine. This is the DNA template strand. It is the template. It is deciding this way. It's not deciding this is G, so this is copied. This is the template strand. And this is the template strand. Okay, so notes. What notes do we need to know about this? So new DNA polynucleotide nucleotides pair, I'll write this down, new DNA nucleotides. And by that I mean these guys, these fresh ones floating around, pair with complementary bases on the, I'm going to put it in red, template strand. What next? Definitely a key term, DNA polymerase joins the nucleotides together. So what the reaction it's catalyzing does is joining these two together to form that phosphodiester bond. Joins the nucleotides together in A. What type of reaction do you think it is? Joining together, condensation. Forms a phosphodiester bond. However, DNA is anti-parallel. I can say, so the nucleotides are arranged differently. Oppositely, I could have said. DNA polymerase, I suppose I've stuck with it in red, let's keep that, is an enzyme. It's the important part, it's active site. Can only bind to nucleotides at one end. Can't do it like that. Okay, so that's why it must attach and go in one direction. So what happens do we have when we've got our DNA replication completed? Well, this is going to continue all the way down on both sides. So on the outside, we're going to have our template strand. And then on the inside, we're going to have the new strand. In fact, that's probably a bit too far apart. Oh, well, I've started. And then obviously, we're now going to have two of them. So that's our template strand. The template strand is always going to be on the outside. And then our hydrogen bonds connecting our complementary base pairs are going to be like this. And then it's going to recoil. Yep. So we'll have our recoiling to reform our double helix. So what we've noticed here is that half of the DNA from the original strand has been replaced and half of it has been retained. So the most important key term, which I've not mentioned the whole way through, we can say DNA replication is semi-conservative. Half of the DNA is retained. Half of the DNA is new. So it's semi-conservative. Now, this work was done to prove this by a group of scientists called Messelston and Stahl. You don't really need to know. How they did this is an interesting story. They basically, they made some DNA like this guy with one specific type. This, this is our nitrogenous bases. They made it with a heavy type of nitrogen. So they could basically isotopically tell that they could identify all of this. 
They then put it in a new medium with new, different nucleotides, which were a different type of nitrogen in them. They could tell them apart. They then basically looked at the new DNA that was formed when after one repeat, and they, they could weigh it. The, the weight of this nitrogen was heavier than the weight of this nitrogen. And so if this was the case, then the new one would be intermediate between the two. Or if it was you're going to get a, the original copy was going to be maintained and then you had an all red one over here and you kept an all black one over here, then you'd had one heavy and one light. So they used the weight of different isotopes of nitrogen to tell which ones, which type of nitrogen was in which strand of DNA.